Okay. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for taking the time to join us. I want to thank Rabbi Postelnik. Uh, thank God. One of one of the exciting things, one of the many exciting things that Rabbi Postelnik uh, has already brought to our shul, and Bez Hashem will continue to do so, is interesting topics for series and the like. Uh, for anyone who's been watching me over the years, you'll know I'm not good <laughs> at coming up with interesting topics for series, but um, I'm happy to allow Rabbi Postelnik to schlep me along and participate in, uh, in, in one of these series at uh, Mir Tashem. I'm sure we as a show look forward to many, many wonderful series for Rabbi Postelnik, and I hope to have the opportunity to join it every now and then. Um, tonight's talk is really intended as a very practical talk. Uh, I was already asked if I have source sheets. The answer is no. <laughs> I'm sorry, because this is really, um, I'm sure there'll be a certain amount of repetition from things that Rabbi Postelnik spoke about last week, but this is really intended to be um, a practical understanding of how to deal with the situation uh, as Jews in the diaspora during the Shemitah year. What I will ask people to do, uh, if you have questions or comments, is I'll just request that you put it in the chat box. What I think the best way to do it is if you would put your question or comment in the chat box, and then as we're proceeding, I can just pause for a moment and read whatever chats have come in. And that way I can just decide if it's a question that will be addressed down the road later in the talk anyway. And then at the very end, I'll encourage everyone to, if you weren't able to put a question in the chat, you know, call out questions and the like. But while we're going, if you could just put your question in the chat, I think that would be the most uh, productive way. Okay. There's a fundamental halachic problem with bringing Shemitah produce from Israel to the diaspora. There are obviously, as you can imagine, various permissible ways to do it, but barring any unique dynamic, there's a fundamental halachic problem with bringing Shemitah produce from Israel to the diaspora. It actually is connected to a Pasuk when the Torah talks about Shemitah. If you put the, the Kam in a certain way, the way you could read the Pasuk is, in your land, all of the grain will be to eat, all the produce will be to eat. Which means if you understand the Pasuk in that, in that breakup of words, which is not the standard breakup of the words, but if you understand it as a, a directive from the Torah, then actually that would mean there's a Torah problem with taking produce during Shemitah from Israel out of Israel. There's definitely a school of thought that it's not a Torah problem. There's definitely a school of thought that it's a rabbinic problem. And that, like many things in the Gemara, um, the rabbis sort of latched it onto a pasuk. It's what we call an asmachta, um, a hint. But what this should make very clear as we proceed to discuss is, though, again, I reiterate, there are permissible ways to bring Shemitah produce outside of Israel. The issue of Shemitah outside of Israel is very different than the issue of Truma and Maser outside of Israel. In other words, I know, I know it's a frustration that um, many people from our community have that the general attitude um, among many in diaspora Jewry is if it's produce from Israel, from Israel, I don't want to have anything to do with it because gosh, Truma and Maser, and it's so scary and it's, you know, and it's a frustration that's been expressed to me by different uh, members of our community before. There's a way to do Truman Maser. It's not impossible to do Truman Maser, and you can support the Israeli economy. So be a little courageous with the Truman Maser and buy Israeli produce. You know, that, that, that's an argument, and it's a strong argument to be made. What's important to recognize is Shemitah is a very different discussion because there's fundamentally Allah concern about taking Shemitah outside of Israel in the first place. And so even if we can work out a way that's permissible for me to purchase it and permissible for me to partake of it, which we'll talk about, God willing, it could be that the person who exported it, the company that exported it to, Israel, uh, to the diaspora, it could be was doing something incorrect in the first place. Now, it could be it's okay, we'll talk about that, but I just want to make the distinction that the reluctance to buy Shemitah produce from Israel is a very different 
and a much more understandable reluctance than to buy Shemitah produce the rest of the, the, the rest of the other years. So just please keep that in mind. Okay. What would be the problem? What's the concern, especially if we say it's a rabbinic issue? What's the concern with taking produce from Israel outside of Israel? Broadly speaking, there are two explanations given as to what the concern is. One is the idea of beer. I, I, I'm sure Rabbi Pastalnik spoke about beer last week, but just, just so we're all on the same page, beer is that once a given item of produce is no, can no longer be found in the fields, then the halacha is if one has the item in their own home, then one has to either declare it ownerless and let other people come and take it, or one has to actually destroy it. It's one or the other. There's a school of thought which says biur is actually supposed to occur in Israel. Being that the, the Shemitah produce comes from Israel, the Shemitah produce has the sanctity because it was grown in Israel, biur is supposed to happen in Israel as well. In which case, if there's a given food item that gets sent out to the diaspora, so you lost your opportunity to, to be around it in Israel. That's one possible concern. Um, the other concern, which I'm sure is something we can all relate to, is people outside of Israel are, are not regularly dealing with laws of Shemitah with most of their produce. So if a person exports produce from Israel to the diaspora, it's distinctly possible that the diaspora consumer will get all confused as to a, how to deal with the produce in the first place, but B, more relevantly, get confused as to which produce was from Israel and which produce was from the diaspora in the first place. So those are two of the classic reasons as to why uh, it, it's really a halachic concern to export Shemitah produce to the diaspora in the first place. Um, I should mention that there is a school of thought in halacha that if the produce is was planted specifically with the intent of exporting it, there's a school of thought that it's all right to export. So it's not so it's not necessarily across the board that Shemitah produce may not be exported, um, but but it could be even if it's full fledged Shemitah, if it was planted with the intent of export, it could be that it would be all right to export. To the diaspora. There's discussion about that. Now, this is very important to recognize. Even if uh, produce was exported to the diaspora in a prohibited manner, which we're going to talk about, there are going to be various ways that it's all right to do so. But if it, even if produce was exported in a prohibited manner, there are many opinions that hold it's fine for me to purchase it, even if it was exported in a prohibited manner. Okay, so it wasn't there could be a given item that wasn't supposed to be exported, but I'm still allowed to purchase it from the store, but there will be different considerations that need to take place as we'll discuss soon. Um, what is very important to recognize, I'm sure this came up last week as well, is a halacha as follows. If I pay you, if, if you have Shemitah produce, and I pay you for that produce, I pay you in cash for that produce, then the halacha is that that cash that you now have takes on Shemitah status. I'm sure you heard about this last week, that that cash that you now have takes on, so I, I, I you had oranges, and I bought oranges from you, and I paid you cash for it. So now the cash that I gave you takes on Shemitah status. So all the limitations on the oranges that I gave you now hold true, oh, the oranges that you gave me, excuse me, now hold true for the money that I gave you. So it's, it's worthwhile to recognize that if I go into a Jewish owned store and I buy, in the diaspora, and I buy Shemitah produce with cash, from the Jewish owned store, besides whatever other concerns might be on the table, that money that I gave that store owner, if it, that Jewish store owner now has all the limitations of Shemitah, which is A, a concern for him. Does he know what that means? Is he only gonna use that money for Shemitah purposes? And B, if he then in turn gives that money as change 
to the next customer, then that's an issue for the next customer as well. So it gets complicated. Now, having said that, I suppose this came up in discussions last week, but if you buy on credit and quite possibly with a check as well, then the sanctity of Shemitah doesn't transfer to what you did. So that's an important thing. If you were to buy Shemitah produce from a Jewish-owned store, it's definitely important to be conscientious about not buying with cash, but buying with credit. Okay. Okay, I just want to see if there's any... Okay, so again, just to sort of pause for a moment and just clarify what we've said so far. Um, we've discussed that there's a fundamental concern with exporting produce from is Shemitah produce from Israel to the diaspora. Uh, we discussed why that might be. We discussed some possible, a possible exception or two. And um, we discussed some of the side concerns. Okay, but now here we are. And whether I knew it, whether I didn't know it, I bought Shemitah produce from a store. Now, what? what? What happens now? Okay, so the first thing that's very important to recognize is even if everything was done correctly with that Shemitah produce, it could be that the Shemitah produce wasn't dealt with right in the first place. It could be it was worked in a way that it wasn't supposed to have been worked, and then it's, it's actually prohibited to, to, for me to benefit from it. But assuming that everything was done correctly with the Shemitah, I'm not allowed to throw it in the garbage afterwards. I'm sure you heard about that last week as well. I'm not allowed to throw it in the garbage afterwards. Um, and I'm not allowed to use it in an abnormal way. So for each item of produce, I have to assess what are the normal ways to deal with it. And once I assess what the normal ways are to consume it and derive benefit from it, those are the ways I may derive benefit from it and no other way. One of the classic examples, and this is very important to keep in mind, even in the diaspora, if someone gets their hands on Shemitah wine, okay, probably the example was given last week, if someone gets their hands on Shemitah wine and they use it for Havdalah, what do we all do for Havdalah at the end? We overflow it a little bit, right? We overflow the cup a little bit. There's a problem with pouring that out into the sink at the end, that overflowed wine, because there was a little bit of wine that we didn't consume in the normal benefit way. So this is just one of many examples that it's very important to be conscientious about when consuming Shemitah fruit um, to make sure to fully consume it. And we know that if one doesn't fully consume it, one isn't just supposed to throw it in the garbage can. I'm sure you had this last week also. There's a special type of receptacle you're supposed to use for Shemitah purposes to just let it sort of rot, um, but not to expose it to other garbage, which would hasten the rotting process. So I'm sure what many of you are wondering about as we're talking about this is what does this mean? Does this mean if I go to the store tomorrow and I see oranges from Israel that I have a Shemitah issue? So the answer is no. As I'm sure was discussed last week, different types of produce have different types of calendars and seasons in terms of what would make it associated with Shemitah, what would make it a Shemitah problem. Um, so I saw from the OU that they say that this whole issue about treatment of Shemitah produce is not relevant until the first quarter of 2022. Okay, so that's, that's a, a good thing to keep in mind, just practically. So it's not a Shemitah Shaila, definitely not until New Year's. <laughs> and, and, and then at that point, um, you can uh, kind of keep yourself abreast. It's very interesting. Uh, God sometimes has a sense of humor and sometimes God is just kind to us. Uh, as I was preparing over the past days for this presentation, I was very frustrated because I was looking around online. I don't know if anyone remembers from the last Shemitah, um, they, they, they come out with these great booklets about this produce and that produce, and this is the date you have to worry about, and this is the date you have to think about this, this is the date you have to think about that, and I couldn't find anything online. And then, thank God, in my email today, I got, probably many of you got it, 
um, I got an email from the OU. Um, if you go to the OU's website, they have a special, if people are aware of the OU like Pesach guide, they have a special kosher in Israel guide that's available for download on the OU's website. And it's on page 60 <laughs> of, the, of the kosher in Israel guide is a Shemitah guide. And in that Shemitah guide is an alphabetized list of produce with relevant dates. Okay, so this is uh, uh, definitely worth, uh, but like I said, for us in America, the question isn't even relevant until 2022, okay? Uh, last time, last Shemitah year, thank God we were able to send out different types of um, updates and the like, you know, for different types of produce to keep people abreast of things during Shemitah. We'll try to, but please don't completely rely on us. Uh, the general rule is, unless Barbara Price reminds me, I'm terrible on staying on top of these things. And it's not fair to completely rely on Barbara Price for this. So um, I, I, I will, you could always feel free to contact me, um, but I will specifically mention again, the OU has very good, as part of their Kosher in Israel guide, they have a very nice alphabetized list of produce and relevant dates. So that's a, a good thing to, uh, to keep in mind. Okay, so if I buy an item of Shemitah produce, I have to be very, if it's in the zone that we say, oh, oranges at that time are a Shemitah issue. If it's before that point in time, it's not an issue. It's not a problem. I can throw it in the garbage like I would any other orange. I don't have to drink all the wine. But once it's within the zone, that's an issue. That's for the beginning of the cycle. But then, as I'm sure you've already learned, there's an issue when it comes to the end of the cycle. The idea of biur, as we mentioned a few moments before, is that, um, thank you very much, I already see Menasha must have shared a file um, of the link for the OU, OU guide. Thank you, Menasha. Um, biur is that once that item can no longer be found in the field, you have to either declare it ownerless or destroy it. Now, so that's a very important thing to keep in mind. That's the other end of the dates, of the relevant dates. So the first end is once it's once the Shemitah year has begun for this type of produce, I have to make sure to not throw it out. Just like that, I have to make sure to consume it in the normal manner. But I also have to be conscientious. If it's a Shemitah item, I'm supposed to be done with it by a certain date. Um, just to give you a sense, uh, just a, a quick glance at the OU's chart. The, so there are pro, there's produce, for example, that the time for beer is like Purim time, 2023. So it, it's 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 a it's a wide ranging it's a wide ranging um, span here. You know, so 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 keep that in mind. But practically speaking, what it means is if I have my hands. On, on Shemitah food, I have to have consumed it and different produce have different dates. I have to have consumed it by that point in time. Now, if I still have it around, it's not the end of, it's not the end of the world. All I have to do is at the time where the beer is required, I tell three people that I'm declaring it ownerless. It's not mine. I leave it outside for a little bit and then I can reclaim it afterwards. Okay, that's that idea of Hefka, which I'm sure Rabbi Bistalman spoke about last week. But what's a bigger issue, first of all, I have to be cognizant of that, but what's a bigger issue is if a store had it in its possession at the time of Beaver and didn't render it ownerless and didn't say whoever wants could come and get it, then it's prohibited for all of us. Okay, so... This is a very complicated piece. I, I, I think the most common issue that it presents itself with is probably wine, because wines have a way of sticking around for a long time. Um, I saw, again, you can check if it's relevant. Um, I saw the time for beer for wine is Erev Pesach. I, I, I wasn't clear to me. I'm sure you'll be able to see it on the chart. It wasn't clear to me if it was Erev Pesach this year or next year. It's probably Erev Pesach next year. That's what I would guess. But, um, but the bottom line is, if you get your hands on Shemitah wine, and if it's, if it's an Israeli wine, you've got to read, read the fine print. If you get your hands on Shemitah wine, 
if it's past the time of Biur, unless you know for a fact that it was dealt with appropriately by whatever store, you, 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 you really shouldn't be consuming it. Okay, I hope that, I hope that made sense to everyone. Um, okay, and the, um, the corollary of that is if there's a person that you're skeptical that they're, whether or not they're dealing with Shemitah in the right way, once the time of beer has come and gone, you're really not allowed to purchase something from them if it's a Shemitah-related product because you just don't know what, what is. Okay, there's a lot more to talk about, but I just want to pause for a moment for, for any comments. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you for that. A person posed a question about planting seeds, I believe if it's a seed that normally would not be eaten, if I remember correctly, it'd be all right to plant them. But if it's a seed that is commonly eaten, it would be an issue and you would not be allowed to plant it, to the best of my knowledge. Um, I, I want to respond to the credit card question. Um, I want to respond to the credit card question very, very quickly. Um, the fact that I, I think that the rationale about the credit card is that in the end of the day, uh, you know, sort of electronic transfer of currency is not the same as regular currency. I, I think that's the assumption. I think that's a fair thing to say. Thank you. Okay, let's see what else we have. Okay, um, thank you for the question about wine. Let me, let me say for a moment, this is extremely important to be aware of um, during the Shemitah year. The major American hashgachas, um, OU, Star K, certainly, I, I would assume Chaf K and OK as well, but you could double check. The major American hashgachas do not certify Shemitah produce that comes over from Israel. That's the general, that's the general thing. So if you're getting wine and it's an OU, and I would imagine an OK also, you don't have to worry about Shemitah. Okay, but if it's wine that has an Israeli hashkacha, an Israeli certification, and doesn't have one of the major American certifications, I want to emphasize, I'm not saying it's not kosher. It could be perfectly kosher, but you got to read the fine print. You know what it's akin to? It's akin to the Pesach hashkachas. You have to make sure whether or not it's kitneos. You, know, you got to read the fine print. So for the Israeli Ashkachas on wine and the like in these years, you got to just, just take the extra moment to read the fine print. If it says Shemitah and more likely than Shemitah would be a term that we're going to talk about very soon that I'm sure Reb Pestalnik mentioned, maybe not, which is Otsar Beisden. Otsar Beisden is a very relevant term, which we will speak about soon, God willing. Another relevant term is relevant term is Heter Mechira, um, which we will also speak about soon, God willing. Um, but that's just a general, general thing. I hope I answered your question about wine. Yeah, so um, it's a very interesting question. There's certainly what to be said as the mitzvah of eating shmita produce. Um, personally, I would say that the concerns, not just the concerns about you and me, but the concerns about what might have happened in getting the produce to you and me in terms of exporting Shemitah produce, I, I, I think you're probably better off. Um, I, I wouldn't see it as a unique mitzvah to purpose, purchase Shemitah produce in the diaspora. That's what I personally would say. I'm sure there are those who disagree. That's my, what my personal thoughts would be. Thank you for asking that. Okay, um, to the best of my knowledge, thank you very much for the Costco Shemitah oranges question. Um, so to, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think Costco, I, I think Costco is a, it's a bunch of stockholders. I, I think it's a corporation. That's what I would assume. Um, um, I, I certainly don't think Costco is owned by a Jew, not to my knowledge. Um, so this thing about transfer of the sanctity of Shemitah, to the best of my knowledge, is only if the seller is a Jew. So if you're getting cash change from Costco, I think you're fine. Hope I answered that. Okay.
Thank you. All those questions were very valid. And whatever questions I didn't comment on, it's because I'm getting there soon, God willing. Um, okay. So everything we've been talking about until now is assuming that the produce coming over from Israel is totally Shemitah produce. Is there a way to avoid some of these halachic concerns during the Shemitah year with Shemitah produce? So there are many creative options. So for example, you probably discussed this last week, it could be that maybe the, the area of what we think of as Israel that it came from is not halachically Israel. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about hydroponics. Um, you know, it's not growing from the ground. It's great. Those are discussed. But I want to talk about the two most major um, uh, possible workarounds in terms of issues regarding Shemitah. The most famous one, hands down, is Heter Mechira. Okay. What is the idea of Heter Mechira? The idea of Heter Mechira is, um, just to be clear, it's, it's widely offered by the Rabbanut in Israel. It's not automatic. It's if it's if a, if a landowner signs up for heter mechira, okay. But heter mechira is a person can have their land sold to a non-Jew, and the assumption would be that the land is now under the ownership of a non-Jew, and that the restrictions of shemitah produce do not apply to land owned by a non-Jew, and therefore this produce that's grown is not impacted by the um, sanctity of Shemitah. It would not have a bearing on whether or not I can throw out the item afterwards. It would not have a bearing on how I use the item. It would not have a bearing on, do I have to declare the item ownerless afterwards? It would not have a bearing on what happens to the money. It would not have a bearing on any of those things. But like any good solution in the Jewish world, there's disagreement about it. It wouldn't be a Jewish idea if there wasn't disagreement, you know? Um, so as, as I'm sure many of you know, there's a lot of disagreement about Hetu Mechira. Um, on the most basic level, there's disagreement if the sanctity status of Shemitah produce could be impacted by a sale to a non-Jew. So that's a very technical halachic discussion and you have different opinions about it. And there of course are very, very famous through the ages halachic authorities that encourage the Hetu Mechira at different times. Basic summary would be that those authorities would say there's a difference of opinion, but the need of, of making it feasible to keep the economy from Israel going and, and have appropriate produce in Israel, so on and so forth, outweighs the halachic concerns and there are halachic opinions to rely on and therefore the heter mechira is worth it. And then, as you can imagine, through the ages, there have been opinions that say, hey, no one said Shemitah was supposed to be easy and uh, Shemitah is one of those times when we stretch ourselves and let's not do the heter mechira. It's not clear that it's, it's not, hands down clear, according to all opinions, that it's a valid halakhic approach, so don't rely on it. So you have different opinions about that. Um, I, it, I'm sure many of you are thinking that it feels quite reminiscent of selling chametz. I'm sure uh, many of you are thinking about that. I do want to clarify that, again, there's this, it's the question about Hector Mechira is not only do we find loopholes or do we not find loopholes, there's a much more technical discussion of the dynamic of being able to sell the land in Israel and changing Shemitah status because of it. You get different opinions and, and uh, there's different opinions in cloud Israel. Um, for whatever it's worth, just to give you a context, um, the major, the major uh, American hashkachas uh, do not to not rely on, on the Hetu Mechira. Uh, and again, that's, that's a policy matter and a partial policy, partial halachic opinion, but everyone is entitled to their own approach. But one should just make sure one has rabbis to rely on. But I want to be very clear about something. It's a mistake to assume that anything that comes from Israel was covered by the Hetu Mechira. That's a mistake. 
a person should, if a person decides to rely on Hetu Mechira, it should be that they know whether it be they've researched this specific brand or there's some notification on the on the package itself. It should be that you have awareness that that the Hetu Mechira was used. Okay, so I hope that's clear. Um, now, the other one, which is much more accepted halachically, sorry, that didn't come out the right way, accepted by a much, accepted across the board halachically, sorry about that. The other one, which is accepted across the board halachically, but more complicated, that's the trade-off. If you want to do something that everyone thinks it's good, it's going to be more complicated, um, is oats are based in. Um, I want to give a brief summary of how oats are based in works. It's already late. So here's the general gist. As I'm sure you learned last week, I'm not allowed to harvest produce in Israel and treat it as mine and mine alone. I'm not allowed to do that. Okay, I'm allowed, and you know, and, and then merchandising. That's a fundamental problem. Maybe I'm allowed to sell small amounts. Okay. Let's say, and by the way, and if and even small amounts that I sell, the money that I get takes on status of the sanctity of Shmita. Let's say we make a committee. And, and we make a large committee of people, and it's our job as a communal body to collect all of the hefker, the ownerless produce out in the fields, okay? And then we'll make that produce available to whoever wants it. With one catch, we're working hard. So we're not selling the produce because the produce isn't ours to sell. But what we are doing is we're saying, if you want to be part of this conglomerate or this part of this union, you need to pay for the labor involved with providing the produce. So it's not that you're purchasing the produce. It's that you're reimbursing the group that gathered the produce for their labor. It's a very nifty concept. This idea or variations on this idea go back to the times of the rabbis of the Mishnah. It goes far, far back. And so basically what oats are based in does is the item is still sacred from a Shemitah perspective. Okay. But you'd be allowed to sell it or purchase it and the money would not take on Shemitah status. Okay, and the other thing, for reasons I don't want to take the time to get into now, there's definitely an argument that if it's oats are based in, it's more permissible to export. It has to do with the bits of beer. And there's one more wrinkle. This gets a little bit confusing. If an item is oats are based in, that it's not being held by a person, it's kind of belonging to a communal group. And when you pay for it, you're just reimbursing them for their expenses, okay? When it's oats are based in, if it was still in the hands of the base, of the communal group, when the time for beer came around, it already was accessible to anyone who wants it. So whereas everything else, oh, when beer comes around, you have to render it ownerless, you have to destroy it. If it's still part of the communal group's holdings, when the time for beer comes around, nothing more need be done. So practically speaking, if you purchase an item through oats or based in, you still need to treat it with the sanctity of Shemitah. You don't have to worry about what happens to the money. And if you purchase it from the oats or based in after the time for beer, that's okay. Whereas most items, if you purchase after the time for beer, it's not acceptable unless you know that the seller did it appropriately by the beer time, oats are based and it's okay. But there's a very important caveat on that, which is if I go into a store and they're selling oats are based in wine and it's after the time of beer, I don't have a right to assume that the store was considered like an emissary of the oats are based in. And so we normally say that if it's possible that the store held the wine before the time for beer, and I'm not purchasing it after beer, we normally say I've got a problem. 
then I shouldn't, I shouldn't be partaking of that wine. And similarly, if I purchase the oats are based in wine before the date for beer, let's say before Pesach, and I, I, I need to render it ownerless when the time for beer comes. And then if I dealt with it ownerless in the way that we described before, then I can reclaim it. So oats are based in is not a problem with beer if it belonged to the based in at the time of beer. But if it belonged to the store owner or I already purchased it at the time of beer, then I have to do the normal beer things. Okay. Um, I want to pause to get to some of the new questions. Um, someone asked me a very interesting question. Um, if a person is at a restaurant in Israel, whose problem is it? to deal with the Shemitah, to dispose of the Shemitah appropriately afterwards. Um, my guess is, I, I, I have to confess, I'm, I'm, I'm out of Israel. Um, my guess is, if it's a reliable certification, they'll make sure that the uh, service providers deal with things appropriately. Um, if it's not a reliable certification, they're probably not on top of it, but you probably don't want to eat there in the first place if it's, if it's not a reliable certification. But I, it's worth checking with somebody uh, somebody who's in, plugged into what's going on in Israel. Thank you for posing that question. Okay. Um, I want to just address one more topic um, that might be uh, the most relevant for most of us, and that is Esrogim, right? Many of our Esrogim come from Israel. It wasn't an issue for Esrogim this past Sukkot because it's just the beginning of the Shemitah year. It is an issue for Esrogim um, next Sukkot. So an Esrog, right? All, all, all of you people, uh, somebody must have a great aunt somewhere who used to make Esrog jelly. Maybe there are some people who still do. Um, so, but an Esrog is something that could be connected to food. Okay. If you check Debbie Rogel's background, those are... Um, S rogue jelly stew, if anyone knows. I'm joking. I'm joking, Debbie. Don't worry. I nah, don't worry. Okay. So um the so uh the bottom line is um S rogim are impacted by the limitations of Shemitah. Okay, so what does that mean? So it's fine to use it for a mitzvah. Of course, it's fine to use it for a mitzvah. The issue is about you can only use it this way versus that way it has to do with consumption. When you're using it for a mitzvah, you're not consuming it, okay? What it means is as follows. First of all, if you were to make esrog jelly, oh. you have to be much more thoughtful about, I'm just gonna mute everybody just to cut down on sound. Uh, if, if you were to make esrog jelly, you have to be much more thoughtful um, regarding how you deal with the remains um, and the like. That's one thing. Um, but two questions, three questions. First of all, when I'm buying a lula of an esrog, if it's from Israel, is there an issue with, do I have to specifically use cash? I'm sorry, do I have to specifically use a check? Is there a problem with using cash? If, if, if I pay cash for my lula of an esrog, do we say that the money takes on the status of, uh, you know, of Shemitah? So there's an idea called Havla. Havla is that if the money is not specifically for the Shemitah item, but the money is for a broad range of things, many of them not Shemitah, then it wasn't called money for Shemitah. So, of course, most of us, when we buy an Esrog, we're buying not just an Esrog, we're buying an Esrog, Lulav, Hadassim, and Aravos. Okay, now the restrictions of Shemitah only apply to something that's edible. So Lulav, Hadassim, and Aravos are not edible. So as long as I'm buying them as a package, the, the, the monetary concerns about, um, about the esrog in terms of Shemitah don't kick in. That's one point. Uh, second point, we keep on talking about, is there a problem? We, keep, we were at the beginning, we we're talking about that there's an issue with exporting esrog or Shemitah produce outside of Israel. Is that a problem for the mitzvah of Esrog? 
So you have different opinions about it. We already said that if you had in mind when you planted it, that it was going to be exported, it might be okay. I'm sure you can imagine that there could be an argument that if it's for a mitzvah, it might be okay, right? The mitzvah of Esro. The most classic approach, as we already touched on actually, is if it's oats are based in, it's all right. So many, many, many of the Esrogim that make it over from Israel actually are oats are based in Esrogim. Now, there's a famous question because I'm not consuming the esrog, am I supposed to send the esrogim back to Israel after I use it? Remember, we had said there's an idea that beer maybe is supposed to happen in Israel. So you have different opinions about this. Uh, Rabbi Einar Zichron of Rachel was very strongly of the opinion that as long as it was oats are based in, it does not have to be sent back to Israel. Okay? But there's one more issue. Even if it's oats are based in, I can't, as we already said, I have to treat this organ with respect, which means I can't just dispose of it after sukkahs. We normally say after sukkahs, you take it, so you shouldn't throw it in the garbage, but you put it in a double bag, you put it in the garbage. That's what we normally say in a normal year. If it's a Shemitah Esra, we wouldn't say that. If it's a Shemitah Esrog, we would have a concern with you putting in the garbage. What you're supposed to do with a Shemitah Esrog is you're supposed to just hold it until it totally dries up. And it's just the pit. And so there's no part of it that's consumable anymore. And then you can dispose of it. Um, What we've done in years past, and God willing, we'll do this year. Don't tell anybody from the office I said this, but God willing, we'll do it this year too. Um, which is we tell people after sukkahs that they're welcome to drop off their esrogim at the shul and, and we just hold on to it uh, because it's hard to remember sometimes, you know, that I have to hold on to it and I have to, you know, so th- we hold on to it and then once they've totally dried up into pits, then we dispose of them. Okay. Um, uh, let me just see quickly if there were any more questions. Right. Okay. Um, Okay, so I think that's that's really what I've got. Oh, one, one more point. A number of you contacted me, and this is actually going to be the primary topic for the last uh, session in the series, which is not going to be next week. It's two weeks from tonight, God willing. But a lot of people, I got a lot of nervous phone calls before Rosh Hashanah this year. I should have been pr- proactive. I apologize for that. Prusbal. Prusbal is the halacha that if, if a Jew owes another Jew money, Shemitah, cancels debts unless one has a principal document. The standard halacha is that the end of Shemitah cancels the debt. So the idea of principal before Rosh Hashanah is at the end of this year. In other words, there's a stringency that some people have to do a principal both before this past Rosh Hashanah and before next Rosh Hashanah. But the basic halacha of principal is before next Rosh Hashanah. So we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that, God willing. And that, of course, is true all over the world. Um, Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you for all the great questions submitted. Um, if anyone has a question that they would like to either chat to me or call out and express for everybody, now is the time. Rabbi, no, Mr. Hornestay? Yeah, um, getting back to that beer question and uh, uh, declaring it ownerless. Didn't God make the produce ownerless at the beginning of the seventh year? And if he did, why would why human being have to confirm God's uh, action? Yeah, I, I, I think, I think uh, I, knowing my customer, I think you're asking it more hashkafically than halakhically. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Very good. Correct. Okay. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think hashkafically, I think beer is actually an extremely powerful uh, halakha when you think about it, because not only when I take it, do I have to realize that it was, it's not really mine, but I can't hold it indefinitely. I can't hold it indefinitely. And once it hits a certain time, I have to yet again relinquish ownership of it. Um, I don't know that this is really a Hashkafic point or more just a, a practical point. Look at us today. How many of us are farmers and how many of us are consumers? Right. So as a consumer, so fine, it was a little bit more of a patchy at the market than it normally is. But at the end of the day, we came home with our oranges. You, you, you know what I mean? And, and, and so now the fact that even when we bought the oranges, we went through this, we went through that. We were careful with the, with the check, with the, this, that. 
it still wasn't, comp- it's not ours indefinitely. I think there's a very powerful reminder in that. I think that's the way to look at it. Thank you for raising the point. Richard, did you want to say something? Yes, I had a couple of questions. Please. please. Um, I, I, the first, I, what if the produce um, was oats are based in? Can that be exported? Is it- there, there, there's definitely a school of thought that's more inclined to allow the export of produce if it's oats are based in. But I want to emphasize that most of the other halachos of Shemitah are still in play. In other words, people sometimes get confused with oats or basin. Like once it's oats or basin, it's like good. It's very different than heter mechira. You know what I mean? So the the issues that would be off the table, that, that might be off the table because of oats or basin, is export might be okay because of oats or basin. That's one thing. Um, the sanctity of the money might not be an issue because of oats or basin. And biur would not be an issue if I bought it from the Basin, not from a store, but from the Basin after Shas Biur. But if it was no longer in the Basin's hands by Shas Biur, Biur would still be an issue. So in certain circumstances, Biur is still an issue. And the way I treat the item itself is definitely still an issue. Did I answer your question, Richard? Yes, yes. Thank you. And, and uh, the, the second question, just following up on uh, uh, Lula Venetrog, um, I had thought that when we're buying the lulav and etrog, in a sense, we're buying the lulav and we're not buying the etrog. Is that yeah, the way you I, get around that? Um, yeah, that's that's what I meant to say. I, maybe I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I might not have expressed it well. But technically speaking, you're you're buying uh, the lulav. Yeah, and and kind of like the etrog is actually. I, I didn't say it well. Let me re-say it. Thank you, Richard. I'm buying the lulav, the lulav, or the dasim, the rubbish, whatever it is, and the etrog is essentially being thrown into the package. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that was a better way to say it. Thank you very much. And as long as we, on our own, uh, like we happen to keep us rogum for many years till they show up, they're brown, and then we think they're you know really nice, we just hold on to them. So as long as we do that, that's okay. With the with the S rogue, it, it, when it's all brown and shriveled up and tiny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, uh, but but again, I, I wouldn't wait for it to be shriveled up. It's not enough to be shriveled up. It, it has to be that it's really just just a pit. That's really you wait for the pit, and I, and I want to be, I want to be very clear about something. I've had the Shila before. You know, you hang, you hang around in the rabbit long enough, you actually get some shmita experience. But um, um, uh, there's someone, uh, someone from our community once called me with the Shila that they love to take remains of esrog and use it with the besamim, and they realized. After and, and they, they, I don't know, they kept a few esrogim over a, a certain amount of time. They kind of mixed it all together. And then it dawned on them at one point that one of the esrogim was from the Shemitah one. It was like a whole shaila then how to deal with it. So, so it, again, it, it's fine. You you could keep it until, but again, it's not just shrivel up. It's that's really a pit. But uh, again, it, if it's convenient for people, it might be good to just send it off to the mm-hmm. shul after sukkahs because then it's just separate and you don't get confused. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Again, a reminder, the next, the fourth and final segment is not next week, but two weeks. I'm sorry, Paul, did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, how, um, sorry. How do we know in the diaspora when the time for beer is for different kinds of produce? Yeah, in that OU, thank you very much. In that OU guide, if you go to the OU's website, I only saw it today. I think they really just started advertising this OU kosher for Israel. It's like the same kind of thing you could download, although just like you can download their Pesach guide. Um, they have a Shemitah section and, and it's like columns. So there's an item and when is the time that you have to begin to worry about it being Shemitah? And when is the time for beers? So it's, 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 it's there. It's a good resource. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Anything else? Okay. A good night to all. Thank you very much for joining. Good night, Rabbi. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you. Ellen. See you, Ellen. Thank you.